Well, hello, friends. I, I apologize. I don't know what that voice was. <laughs> hey, everybody. Welcome back to Pretend World's Real People. As always, I'm Tyler. And yeah, I'm over-caffeinated. It's uh, starting to cool down here in Colorado, despite a very hot weekend. Uh, and I just, I, I'm, I think I've, I'm finally shaking off that Monday feeling and embracing a fun work week because I don't have to go and serve to people in a public space behind a bar. So excited. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you really quick. I'll just catch up about what happened uh, this weekend. I did see Tom Segura at Ball Arena on Sunday, which was great. But uh, industry related, I had an all day workshop with my acting studio on Saturday in front of a Los Angeles based rep, which was really, really cool doing a showcase for somebody of that region, because we all know Gaining representation alone is super difficult, but gaining reps from a different market you don't live in or don't have an address in, that's it feels impossible sometimes. So for these kinds of things, I don't I don't bank on, you know, being signed or uh, you know, kind of like developing a relationship with these you know, these reps. I just want to kill my scene. I want to make an impression and then maybe down the line, you know, if that's a possibility of gaining representation, that'd be super duper cool. But within the showcase itself, I just wanted to do a good job. Uh, I did my scene in the morning, then I was a reader for some people in the afternoon, and then we had the Q&A, and then it was just kind of done. So hopefully I get some pretty good feedback this week in class. And yeah, it was just, uh, it was really fun. I, <laughs> I had a chance to perform as Max, Katie, and Cape Fear. I love playing those dark characters, and I just hope I, I made the rep feel uncomfortable when I was performing. That's that's the goal of uh, of mine when I ever, you know, whenever I need to perform as that kind of character, I want to make the person feel uncomfortable um, within the scene itself. So uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. We'll see what happens. And that's been my weekend. But I was super excited to just get this intro going and tell you about who I have on the show this week. I'm a huge fan of this guest and I caught them in a project years ago. And there's something about their on-screen presence that I just really appreciated, and I was hoping that uh, that they would do more. So uh, let's let me just tell you right off the bat, I had a chance to sit down with the amazing Katie Parker. She is a Los Angeles-based actress you may know from Absentia, Oculus, The Haunting of Hill House, Doctor Sleep, or The Haunting of Bly Manor. She is going to be in the upcoming The Fall of the House of Usher by Mike Flanagan. And her film Next Exit just premiered at, I believe it was the Toronto International Film Festival and uh, waiting on distribution. So yeah, if you haven't seen the trailer for Next Exit, look it up. It looks amazing. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes, of course, but super excited for that. And uh, I was just really excited to share this conversation because we had a chance to sit down. <laughs> if um, Just a quick disclaimer, if some of the audio is a little wonky, I guess there were landscapers <laughs> outside of her house while we were recording this, and uh, we edited out a few things just to uh, to save the audio. But I hope it comes out great. It was great on my end, uh, listening to, to her feed, so it should be fine. But in case you hear a little in the background, <laughs> it's it's uh you know, it's just people doing their jobs outside. But we got a chance to talk about you know her artistic journey, how she got to LA, uh, what it's like to find confidence in your career, especially years in. And, you know, this very pertinent aspect of controlling your anxiety as a performer. I, I'm just super excited that she's on the show. I hope I can get her back for a, you know, next exit live stream with Rahul Kohli and, and their director. I think it'd just be a lot of fun. So yeah, I'm just going to shut up. Let's get right into it. Let's have a chat with the amazing Katie Parker. Hi, guys. My name is Katie Parker, and I am an actor. Just an actor? That's it? <laughs> nothing else? There's nothing else? I guess. I'm a, I'm a dog mom. <laughs> um, I like to cook. I love traveling. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I did some research outside of the film. You you wrote a recipe book, didn't you? No. No? No. Oh, There's my a... God, Google. You are the freaking worst. Yeah, well, I... what's interesting is, like, this is why I'm like, don't get any of your information from the internet, because there's, like, 
other Katie Parkers. Yeah. And then I think just because I'm in film, like my pictures out there, but then yeah. other women's information will be like tied to me. <laughs> and then I'll do, yeah, do like interviews and podcasts. And they're like, so you were like an Olympian triathlete. And I'm like, <laughs> no, that's this chick in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, I have glance notes that I put on my other monitor. And <laughs> it says Katie Parker actress. It says Katie Parker is the founder, recipe developer, writer, and photographer of the food blog Veggie and the Beast. Nope. <laughs> Not me. Different person. Well, good job, Google. We're gonna nix that in the bud. Um yeah. I'm keeping all this in, by the way. You keep it in. This is this I... is staying in. Not everybody's perfect, listeners. Uh <laughs> keep it in. I'm into it. Yeah. Well, um, now that that had floundered tremendously, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm really want to know how did you get into acting was it something you fell into later on in life was it something you always wanted to do what's the story there it was something that was always a part of my life um I I grew up with two really artistic parents a lot of music in our house a lot of drawing I have a three other siblings who are very creative people um I danced for a long time from the time I was like three to 17 and would go to New York City and take classes. Sorry, those gardeners are really intense out there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, guys, if you can hear that. Um, I, I guess I did my first play when I was 18. And there was something about the attunement and presence with another person that just resonated deeply. Like I hadn't quite found that connection before like in my family or with friends or through dance, there was something about acting and looking at someone that maybe you don't know very well in the eyes, like your co-star, your scene teammate, if you will. Um, and then just having this attunement with them and this listening and this presence that I, I didn't know what it was because I was 18, but I was like, I just know this feels good. And this feels like being alive fully. And then when I went to college, I remember taking my first like proper acting class and thinking, why doesn't everyone have to do this to like get in their bodies, get in their voice, have to look someone in the eye? Like it just felt like basic stuff that we should pay attention to as we have time here, you know, on, <laughs> on our planet. Um, but I guess it was, yeah, a calling for like I wanted more intimacy in my life or something. and and theater people are so open as you know and, and curious and funny and vibrant um but yeah I didn't I didn't really find acting until I was about 18 I did like plays and stuff throughout like elementary school but I wouldn't say I was like the kid that was like I'm gonna be a star <laughs> it was just something I like did but yeah. then when I was in college I was like oh I could be like a regional stage actor and and that was how I started my act, acting career. I thought I would like go to Chicago or New York and just do like regional stage work. And did you end up going to those different places before Los Angeles or did life take a different route there? No, I, so I actually ended up going to Atlanta, Georgia. I was like 20, 21, I was finishing up college. And my sister has lived there for years and years. And I just went to go visit her. And CBS was there with The Young and the Restless. And they had set up like a cattle call, like one lucky girl will win a chance to be on The Young <laughs> and the Restless and have like two lines. So I got in line and I did that. And I ended up not getting the part, but I met Steve Kent, who was a VP at Sony Pictures at the time. And he helped develop Crackle that like modern family started out on and he just really encouraged me to move to LA and pursue film. And I met a casting director called Karen Ray, who I think she's since retired, but she did like Ghostbusters and the never ending story. And they were um, like my, I guess, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call them men mentors, but they just really encouraged me to come to LA. And so I did. I graduated and, and came out to LA October 2008. And then I met Mike Flanagan, I think that January 2009. 
and, wow. and then he and I became friends and he introduced me into the independent film world. Um, wow. But yeah, so that was, that was like a, a <laughs> great human being to meet right off the bat a few months in LA. Yeah. And um, you never know, right? Like if you meet an independent filmmaker, if it's going to be something legitimate or if they just keep talking about the project and then it just never happens. <laughs> Yeah, and like at that time, Mike was a gigging editor for like reality TV, living in an apartment in in California, and um, he he was struggling to get his scripts read, and he had, had he had done some features, but they were like right out of college, in college. Um, he was an aspiring artist in the way I was, so that's like how I met him, and it's interesting for me now to, you know, see where he's at and then him bringing huge movie stars in to like work <laughs> on his shows. It's like, it's, it's a really special and surreal thing to, to watch success like that happen to someone that you love to see the, the journey. It's been really fulfilling and, and just totally surreal, super surreal. Oh, I bet. It, it's so weird when your friends, it's not, I shouldn't say it's weird. You're so proud when your friends hit that level of success, but it, it seems like you, you said it yourself. It, it's surreal. It feels like a dream. Weren't we just talking about this in a dive bar, you know, 10 years ago? And now, boom, like totally. here it is. And I, yeah, sorry. Go oh, ahead. oh, no, 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 no. You go ahead. You go ahead. <laughs> well, just what's, what's really cool about um, Mike, I was saying this to some of, uh, when I was on the Fall of the House of Usher, I was with some other actors that Mike, literally I don't think he consciously did this but like kind of manifested because we would watch their films you know a decade ago and he would say out loud I want to work with that person or like Zach Guilford for instance um Mike was like we have to watch Friday Night Lights when Friday Night Lights was on all the time he loved that show and and here we are like working with Zach Guilford now you know what I mean it's like it's it's trippy yeah it's, but he's special in that way like that attunement I was talking to you about with acting like Mike has that attunement with people and I think can really see people and um that's what makes him so special to work with yeah so it, in general, he's just a special person and even going back and I vaguely remember watching the marketing like kick funder uh or no kickstarter crowdfunder indiegogo campaign for absentia years ago Mm -hmm. when I was in college and I had to go back recently and just and watch those and I will say like you guys do it was it the five uh five down marketing campaign I think that's what it was called the five but, drive yeah the five drive yeah I love that you've seen this that's so fun. <laughs> it's it's just so much fun it you were you were talking about that like that attunement and that intimacy that creators have together and watching you know each video listeners if you haven't uh caught on to it I'll put the link in this episode but you guys have two minutes to basically sell this movie and sell your personalities too. Like yeah. yours still has me dying to this day for the, you know, like hooray yeah. for heroin yeah. <laughs> and for getting the E at the very end. It's just yeah, amazing. Yeah. So yeah, I do want to ask you about, you know, that being such an independent film, of course, having like Doug Jones be a part of it. Did you find any sense of like manifestation as you were working on that production as, as an actress? Like, did you sit down and, and kind of bring out the next 10 year goal? Like what was that experience like for you? You know, when I moved to LA, like I think because it wasn't a decision I had fully made for myself, I just kind of did it because I had an opportunity. I'm from Virginia, LA is 3000 miles away from my family. I was 22, working at Starbucks, had no money and, <clears throat> excuse me, had never, I have to cough, guys. Here we go. Katie <laughs> has COVID. Oh, God, no, no. no. <laughs> God, I hope not. <laughs> um, I think just because I had ice cream last night, now I'm all phlegmy and gross. Oh, now you're just going to brag about having ice cream. Oh, so my much God. ice cream. <laughs> oh, God, baby. So good. Um, I... Yeah, when I moved to LA, like I just was really lost and my background was in theater. I had no business being in front of cameras and on a film set. And I always thought that the way 
you would get the film job is you you get an agent, you audition, and then you're on a television series. But for me, I did theater. I moved to LA, auditioned. But the way I got work was meeting people like Mike Flanagan, who introduced me to the film world, which is a gritty, brutal, hard place to be a an actor. It is not it is not precious. It's not going to serve. It, well, I don't want to say it doesn't serve your creativity, but I mean, like when we shot Absentia, I was like sleeping on Mike's couch, you know, and like waitressing and going to shoot the movie and we would shoot. I'd never acted at four o'clock in the morning before, you know, and that's stuff that I think when you're training to be an actor, you don't consider that you might have your big scene at 4 a.m. and you've been waiting since 5 p.m. to shoot that scene. You know, so it's like stuff like that where you're just like, oh, this is like a totally different beast. I don't think I have really come into my own as an actor until recently. Like it really took 10 years um, of just getting more confident in myself, failing a lot, having little successes along the way, building community, learning how to be in front of a camera, and then and and having my relationship to myself and to acting evolve you know like i just cuz acting i think any kind of in, creative endeavor you have there's a relationship to it there are times when i hate it i remember when we were doing absentia i was like i don't know if i want to do this like this doesn't feel fulfilling at all. And then when the movie came out, I didn't feel like I was good in it. I felt really in my head when we filmed it. I felt insecure. I felt insecure about my body, my voice, my choices. And it wasn't really until like the last four, three or four years where I've just been like, you know what? It's not my job to criticize my work. You just do the best you can and you put it out there. Um, and hope that if it resonates with one person, you did something right. Cause it will never resonate with everybody, you know? Yeah. Um, it, that is something that a lot of <laughs> actors have said on this podcast that, that, and even I'm going through that right now. I, I've been in it in 10 years. I had, like you said, limited success. Some things are pop, popping in and out, but yeah, not until you essentially learn how to get out of your own way do you start to like fully embrace that lifestyle I mean you started with absentia you have popped up in all these different projects I mean what was your journey like after absentia like even before Hill House when you were Poppy Hill which by the way it still fucking freaks me out uh <laughs> just, just I still kidding. have like you'll wa I'll walk in my house and go ah shit I should turn around like just to make sure um and I'll go, but, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. oh god don't put that in my head sorry <laughs> wake up ah katie parker boot me um, ah! <laughs> <laughs> but i i love hearing the stories between the successes you know like after absentia and before hill house were you still waiting tables did you have some, like those moments where you thought eh, maybe i shouldn't go like continue with this what was that journey like for you oh yeah yeah I mean, it not not a glamorous one. I after Absentia, I was I was able to get a manager, and I had, I guess I I had had like limited auditioning experience in L.A., which learning that was completely different as well. To go from learning how to audition for theater to being in a teeny tiny room somewhere in like downtown L.A. or mid city. There's a camera and they're like, okay, go. And you, it's just a completely different skill set, I guess. And, and really it's just about, as you said, getting out of your own way and just like making some choices and having confidence in yourself. There's a leaf blower here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Okay. So after Accenture, I got a, I got a manager and was starting to audition for bigger stuff and I'd get, close to stuff but I would never ever book it 
Mm. Um, I just wasn't, I think it was just like a, a confidence thing. And, and it's hard to feel creative when you're poor and when you're, I, I mean, I lived in an apartment with like six other people and was like sharing a room. I've been a waitress, a nanny, a hostess, a promotion person where you hand out flyers, you know, just like gigging, gigging around. And then you're in Hollywood and you feel like this weird separation from the life that you know you want to have from the life you actually have. And I just, I think I just didn't, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to say I didn't believe in myself because I've just stayed with it the whole time. But I think I was just in the way of, of myself rather than being in a place of acceptance and treating myself well, like eating well, getting enough sleep, breathing, basic stuff. Like I just had so much anxiety that I couldn't quite allow the creativity to come through. Yes, yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I totally get that. I, I mean, was there a moment where you sat down and you felt that relief of pressure? I mean, it could be, maybe it's not a serene moment. Most of the time it's, you just botched a callback or something you're sitting in your car and you just tell yourself, fuck it. But, yeah. you know, was, was there a moment like that that caused a sort of um, transition in your confidence or was that just kind of a slow accrued over time moment? Yeah, I moved to Atlanta. I I had been in LA for eight or nine years, eight years, I think. So this would have been the summer of 2017. I was like, I'm done with LA. I'm not happy here. I don't know if I want to be an actor. Maybe, maybe I'll go back to school. I don't know. Um, I'm really good friends with Karen Gillan. And she was shooting Infinity Wars in Atlanta. And my sister lives there and so I got a ticket and I flew there and with no money and just started waitressing. I stayed in Karen's hotel and stayed with my sister and couch surfed for a while and then uh, got a really good nanny job there and started making some proper money to be able to get like an apartment. Um, and then Mike was like, hey, I'm going to come shoot The Haunting of Hill House in Atlanta. Because originally they were going to shoot it in L.A. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know, like I didn't, <laughs> you know, like there was no role or anything. I just, yeah. it was more about like, oh, great. One of my best friends is like going to be in the city that I don't, you know, know a lot of people in. This will be lovely. Um, but that's how Poppy came came about and what really kind of changed my my acting career I had auditioned for Nell didn't get that went to Victoria Pedretti as it should have because she's excellent um and then what's the character called I think it's like is it Joey is that her name I can't remember her name the direct the um Ollie uh Jackson Cohen's girlfriend oh yeah I that Anna Anna played yeah I think it's Oh, oh god i can't I remember can't, that character and i'm a huge fan of that show you think i'd know <laughs> no i mean hey me too i was in it and i'm like i don't remember that character's name um but i had auditioned for that and like that it just didn't feel like my part it didn't click and then mike just kind of gave me poppy and i remember like reading that big monologue and a i couldn't believe that i had auditioned for these other parts and they were just giving me poppy because it felt like such a special part like yeah. a really unique interesting needy complicated character um so, but I, I I don't love auditioning I don't think it's really been my way into <laughs> working as an actor um I'm getting better at it but I, I don't, if they had made me read for it, I'm not sure that I would have got it. You know, I, they might've been like, eh, I don't know. Um, but yeah, he gave me that and that was incredible. <laughs> I knew it was incredible <laughs> when we were doing it. And moving to Atlanta was, um, I think the thing I needed to boost my confidence. There's something really humbling about starting from ground 
zero and being like, I have to do this on my own. I just have to figure it out. And I, I also, there's a small acting community in Atlanta. I guess it's bigger now. Um, but I got agents out there and yeah, started to auditioning and, and, and I booked stuff there, booked other movies, like smaller parts and other films and yeah. And it brought me back to LA. Oh, so you're, whoa. Yeah, I moved, I was <laughs> in Atlanta for, it was under two years. Okay. Like a year and a half, year and eight or nine months, something like that. Yeah. So how does LA feel now? After you left, kind of had a break and, and came back, do you feel better about LA? Like, yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. A lot of it is just like practical things, like having enough money to not stress about, you know, where my rent check is coming from, you know, just basic <laughs> quality of life stuff you know yeah. is different um and I I know this city so well you know like I've been here 13 years like on and off for 13 years and um and have such like a great group of friends and that yeah it does it does feel different I wouldn't say LA has ever been like my city I've never felt like yeah this is this is what's <laughs> up it's just that I don't know if you've ever been here I'm sure you have yeah I so I had oh god this is such a weird story I I'll make it quick I yeah. flew out there to <clears throat> drive a girlfriend back to move to Colorado mm -hmm. so I saw LA for maybe 20 minutes and then just booked it right back so I'm actually planning on going out there in September because I have a lot of friends out there oh, um, cool. but a lot of them are saying the same thing where it's like it's not anyone's home city so to speak you know it's just it's so broad, broad and vast but there's beauty to it so I'm excited to, to go and check it out there is there's a lot of beauty to it and there's also this really like kind of chaotic energy and I think <laughs> people don't or like underestimate how haunted the city is too like in the 20s like this was like a gangster town you yeah. know with like Al Capone and like <laughs> <laughs> they're like dead actresses by the hollywood sign and <laughs> you know, oh, there's this, this like weird energy here that i'm yeah. like oh. sorry i took a dark turn but there <laughs> is i mean it's like it's true they what's yeah. that movie that was made um gangster squad that was all about like oh yeah yeah all the with what mickey mickey cohen mickey cohen Co yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how I knew that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That <laughs> well, I think you just invented a whole new game visiting LA. It's like, oh, yep, someone killed there. Uh murdered actress right there. There's <laughs> I mean, yeah, Charles Manson. Like there's yeah. just so much crazy <laughs> stuff out here that people like blaze over and I'm like, no, oh, always like and also there's Disneyland and <laughs> celebrities and like all this other stuff. But yeah, it's a, it's a weird place. The hikes are good. I mean, probably not as good as Colorado, but, but they're nice. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm really curious to go uh, hike Runyon and just see how quick it ends up being because I'm so used to like 14ers over here, I'll which bet. are yeah. pretty rigorous, but yeah. Go, go, to, go to Griffith Park. Don't Runyon. Runyon sucks. <laughs> what 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 sucks about Runyon? Now I gotta know. You you had a look in your eye, like a past experience. I, I was just there actually the other day with my friend. We were walking our dogs. Um it's just kind of douchey. I don't know. <laughs> like There's, influencer douchey? Yeah. It's like <laughs> that. Yeah. It's a little like that. And and there are also a lot of people that like have dogs that don't know how to handle their dogs. Oh, geez. which is like a pet peeve of mine as like a dog owner I'm like you train that dog um and Griff I think Griffith is just prettier and you've got like okay. the observatory and oh yeah yeah it's nice go to Griffith instead I'm gonna go to Griffith yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. well that that's just I don't know I like that that sort of came full circle for you you know you had those that that doubt and that low confidence you move somewhere new and then opportunity just strikes when you least expect it yeah that that's insane so after you came back to LA did you reach out to your former reps did you pick up new reps I mean with this newfound sort of like Katie energy what yeah. was that transition like because that that's really exciting yeah I mean I was like I don't know that I need reps because all of the work that I 
had gotten had been through my own contacts. And I, I, I will say I'm ambitious in that, like I'll reach out to directors I wanna work with. I have no shame in sending directors, other actors, producers, emails. I'm just like, I'm a person, you're a person. This is what I've done. I'd love to audition for you. Um, I did, I, I got a different manager when I, so I had left the old manager and left the agents in Atlanta. And I got the, the manager I have now, I've been working with him for a few years. Um, and he's great, but I always say to actors, I'm just like, listen, unless you're like, I don't know, Matt Smith at UTA, you're, gonna, you're just gonna be engineering your own work. Like the business has just shifted so much. It's all about making your own content and sourcing through, I think, your own personal contacts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there was a, an energy shift. It's like dating, right? When you're not interested in someone, they're interested in you, right? Yeah. Like it's so, it's kind of, it makes me furious, but it's so basic <laughs> that at the moment you're like, I don't know that I need it. It kind of comes into your life. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like I just, I made a movie with Rahul and um, Molly Elfman, who she wrote and directed this movie called Next, Next Exit that just premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. I've known Molly for 10 years. This is her, I, she's directed before, but like big feature directorial debut. And yeah. um, there's nothing more f fulfilling as a, an actor, creative person than to collaborate with your friends who you love and respect. Yeah. It's the best feeling. Um, and I don't think you need agency managers to, to do that, you know? Yeah, because it seems more transactional, in my opinion, when you're sent somewhere, you know, via your agent or manager. You do the job, you enjoy it, you have fun, but it's nothing like eating pizza at five in the morning that's been cold for eight hours because you and your best friend are making this indie feature for no money. Yeah. that That is just the perfect thing and like you said before networking connecting with people that's been this podcast I feel like I say it every episode but it's like I'm reaching out to people the same way you reach out to directors like yeah you're a person I want to see and hear what your story is uh you know and, and just kind of go from there so it's just cool to know that other people are doing that as well yeah and and you know I I think I was like really ashamed of my story for a long time because like I wanted I wanted like Rahul's story where he oh, booked yeah. iZombie, like he auditioned and booked the thing. Like I thought that's, that's how proper actors work. Like they're discovered, you know, when that's like a rare thing to happen, <laughs> you know, to go to an audition when I think he was 27, maybe when he, oh, was, yeah. he was pretty yeah. young. And I, and, and I mean, he's exceptionally talented, but like, I think everybody is. He just was probably ready for it at the right time. But anyway, like I just thought that that needed to be my journey when mine's been completely different from his, where it's just been the independent film circuit. You know what I mean? And like hustling in a different way, right? Like he still hustles, but in a different department. But I always, yeah, like I always wanted I don't know, like what happened to like Scarlett Johansson or <laughs> Florence Pugh, you know, just like yeah. I wanted to be that. And, and I just wasn't like my journey just looked different. So when other actors are feeling like down on where they're at, I'm just like, oh, you, it, it, this is for you, though. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's for you. I mean, it's something Kate Siegel and I talk about a lot. We met in an acting class like I met her in L.A. in an acting class before she and Mike were together and Samantha Sloyan too. I met both of them there. This was maybe like three years after absentia. And yeah, no and they way. were just like hustling actors as well, you know, waiting tables, doing whatever they could to, to work. Yeah. See, and that's just so cool. Like you said, your friends coming up and yeah. <laughs> you guys are developing these careers. That's, that's insane. I mean, yeah. I was just thinking about it last night uh I was talking about you to somebody and I thought you know why why hasn't Katie and Kate Siegel like I know you guys were siblings in the Haunting of Bly Manor but yeah. 
why haven't you been in a like a, a feature project or develop a, a feature project where you are sisters because you guys look so much alike I feel like it would you could be in an action movie you know <laughs> it would totally. just be really it was just one of those nerdy filmmaker things where I thought you know what they'd be great as a pair leading a feature or a tv show to the point where I wanted to email Mike and go dude, <laughs> dude, come on. dude be, come yeah on. I mean there's been talk about about that of us doing something no like like that because people comment so much on h- how much we look alike yeah. um and there's definitely chemistry there and I think we both would want to do something like that so whoever wants to write it let's <laughs> do it on Mike yeah my- Mike has too much going on but maybe somebody else yeah yeah I might take a stab at it yeah do we'll it see. yeah do yeah it. It, well you both of you have such boundless range it seems like even watching like absentia to hill house to even i know you had a smaller part in dr sleep but just seeing what you do you know i can only see what the next few years have in store for you and them being bigger and better things like you just keep crescendoing including next exit which i'm super excited to see i don't know when it's gonna be available for the rest of us but (laughs) hopefully soon hopefully soon it, it is there any talk of like a Sundance uh presentation next year no we I mean we okay. premiered at Tribeca so that's like the the film festival. oh yeah so I guess you wouldn't really need yeah but we're going yeah. to Fantasia Fest in Montreal in a couple of weeks which will be really exciting Damn. yeah and then, <laughs> um I think a film festival in Washington State in okay. Seattle and that's all I know right now with next exit, but yeah, the film has to get bought and then it'll, it'll be out for the world, but I'm not sure who's, who's buying. So yeah. we'll wait. We'll Somebody wait. awesome is going to pick that up. Come Somebody. on now. Yeah. Come on. Look at the two leads. Look at them Buy the movie. Uh, that is something I'm, I'm super pumped for, but just have this random thought. Sorry, my coffee's kicking in. So yeah, my, I'm lit, man. <laughs> I'm like up and down. I'm like refraining stay really like down <laughs> but then I'm like uh, so it's just it's too much uh yeah, yeah. what if like, you said producing your own content creating your own content as far as like being an actor now are you doing that right now do you write do you do other things to kind of like create your own stuff what's what what keeps you creative outside of acting oh great question I'm I'm kind of finding that right now uh, to be honest because I've never had I'm gonna say it's a luxury um I've I'm new into just being an actor and that's what I do like that's how I make my living I I'm used to having like 16 other jobs so it's a luxury now to be like oh I don't have to work today what do I want to do you know like what should I what should I do and and you need to stay creative it's everything um I have a guitar I pick up the guitar sometimes I'm not great at it but it makes my brain feel good (laughs) <laughs> um, I like to draw. I used to be really into drawing comic books when I was a kid, and that's something I'm trying to get back into. I always think whatever you did when you were a kid, it's like bring that back into your life because that's like the purest form of yeah. creativity before like the world gets you. Um, I just signed <laughs> up for a cooking class and a pottery class. I hike. I'm really active. Take care of my dog. Um, I try to volunteer as much as possible to like get out of myself and there are loads of places you can do that in LA. Yeah. Um, and I took a screenwriting class and it was horrifying for me. <laughs> what? Why? <laughs> Why was it so horrifying? I found it to be like singing. It comes from such a personal place. Like I, I just have the biggest respect for, for writers. Um, I, I liked it. I didn't like it as much as I thought that I would. Um, I had a lot of friends being uh, saying to me, like, you should write, you should write, you should write. But it didn't feel, it didn't feel good. Right did now, it feel it like feel too good. much pressure? Yeah, it did. Hmm. It did. It could have been the class I was in too, where, I mean, it was a very ambitious class. It's like write a feature in six weeks, which is like, that's, that's ambitious. Um, and I think right now in my process as a writer, it's more like I'm going to do a short or write a monologue and like try to develop a voice that way. Um, yeah, but it's, 
I think too, for me with writing, I felt like, and this isn't even like a thing with writing, where I get in the way of myself is where I'm thinking of like a perfectionism outcome where it like oh. needs to be perfect rather than just going moment to moment and writing the shitty draft, you know, doing the shitty take, like just being shit. And then knowing that through the shit, you're going to find the diamond, right? Just from the willingness to fail. Mm. And I think with the the screenwriting class, I just, I just didn't want to fail at it. And I was putting pressure on myself, I think, from having friends be like, I think you might be a writer. I think you should write. And I was like, I can't fail. I got to be awesome. Oh, no. <laughs> So maybe maybe it'll come back around, but no, I don't like I don't create stuff for for myself. It doesn't feel right to. It feels good to like maybe create stuff for other people, um, but I really like the collaboration of another writer's voice, a director's voice, your costume designer, your makeup artist. Like that's what I miss about doing plays is that you have six weeks of rehearsal to make choices with people to create a world together and then present it and let it go out to the audience. But with film, it's such an isolating creative experience, not all the time, but most of the time mm -hmm. you're doing a lot of work on your own. And then you just show up with your choices and hope that they resonate and then try to have that freedom to be able to change when a choice isn't landing or a director wants you to go in a completely different direction um i, I miss that about theater of being able to make something together you do make something together in film it's just for me it hasn't mm. been as satisfying mm. And I think that's just a time thing there's not enough time in film you got to get the shot you know yeah yeah that oh no that makes perfect sense and i mean do you have time to go back to theater just for for fun has it some, been something you've kind of thought about yeah i mean covid's yeah. really put the kibosh on that yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> um fair enough that's true yeah but it's come. i mean it's you know it's coming back which is amazing but yeah i think about it all the time um all the time i think about yeah going to new york and auditioning there's not as much money, there but it, it does feel better. There it <laughs> is. <laughs> I was waiting for that. <laughs> and I've, I've been on more of, like, I miss theater a lot, but I've been on more of a film kick the more confident I've gotten on mm. a film set. It's like, okay, now I'm getting it. Okay, I want to hone this now. It took 10 years for me to figure out how to be comfortable here and how yeah. to work on a set. Yeah. So it feels like... The right thing right now to just keep auditioning and getting hired to show up to sets and feeling free that's yeah. kind of my goal right now honestly that's what i'm getting from you right now is is that thought of freedom you seem so relaxed despite <laughs> being like over caffeinated but you know how it is when it comes so, when someone talks about acting and they haven't reached that point they're so like not i don't want to say high strung but nervous about it like there's that desperation there that hopefully you start to lose as you gain <laughs> some more experience in your career because people can smell, I'm sorry, people can smell it. People just don't want to be around that energy. But the second you start relaxing and go, I mean, it is what it is. We'll see what happens. They want you so bad. So bad. It goes back to that dating thing you were talking about. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> you just seem so majestic and regal. You're like, dude, I'm just, I'm living. You're you're going full McConaughey, L I V I N. You know, you're just living, man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there. I mean, there's so much freedom that comes from failing and being like, oh. I didn't get it. You know, I didn't, or I did fuck that take up. That was bad. You know, and just kind of like owning it. Um, it's getting out of that perfectionism mindset and just yeah. being like, I don't know, like, <laughs> it's a choice. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine i'm gonna go to crafty i'll be back yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. well and I, through like relaxation more stuff can come to you you know if you're 
it's like if you make a fist and squeeze your fist really, 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 really tight, and then you just start to release, it's like you feel space coming through, you know, it's like releasing your hand. Like that's where like the ma the magic kind of happens. You can feel it like in your hand of like the relaxation yeah. happening. And I think I spent so much of my creative life like with tight fists that nothing could be exposed really. Yeah. That, sorry, I'm gonna be doing that constantly <laughs> during auditions and self tapes right. just right before. Yeah. Squeeze real tight and then you yeah. let loose. Like, yeah. That's so, wow, I love that. <laughs> We're getting real spiritual here on the podcast <laughs> like a meditation teacher taught me that yeah like, oh but it's helpful to have that visual yeah. or just to like feel it and be like oh that's that's where I am in that relaxed space like that is the essence of you that comes out yeah. and you're all like this you can't there's it's not you that's a perfect barometer I'm gonna I'm gonna use that that no that's that's fantastic honestly I I do uh I, I want to ask you really quick before I go to my last few questions though yeah. you talked about you know making comic books when you were younger yeah. were you a comic book reader or was it something that you just like to do um I I was but like a very vanilla comic book reader I mean it was like Archie comic books Calvin mm. Hobbes um oh, yes I had all my 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 dad's old comics so I had like these comics from like the 40s 50s 60s <laughs> yeah so I would like what? go in and like draw draw those um like the old Superman comic books that that kind of stuff um and then I just sort of like left that world I don't know what it was of like teenage angst or just yeah. you know that feeling like oh this isn't cool I shouldn't do this anymore oh, yeah. like I loved loved to draw when I was a kid and um, I am, I am a comic book fan, but I don't, I'm not like huge into Marvel or like, I don't get super stoked for films like that. I think they're fun. I've got friends in those films. I go support the friends, but like, um, I don't know. I think the storytelling isn't as exciting to me. I'm more excited by the storytelling in video games than I am by comic books but also oh. I reserve the right to change my mind about that because I know there are some super rad comics out there I, I mean yeah I I stopped reading comics because I wanted to be cool I wanted to to somehow acquire a, a relationship so I thought that was the key like I'm too nerdy but yeah. now freshly 30 I'm getting back into it and there's some amazing stories out there yeah that you know they aren't the big you know uh, big company based comics and they're they're great so that's really cool that you're you're getting back into something that made you happy when you were younger you know as far as like yeah. drawing and and just being more creative that way that's super cool I wish more people would do it it's really relaxing have you read yeah. the book big magic by Elizabeth Gilbert I have not but I'm writing that down um what's the what's the gist of big magic so she's the woman who wrote the book eat pray love like that's what she's really famous for but oh, she was okay. like you know, like, uh, she's been a writer forever. She used to write for like GQ and she's just a rad human being on the whole. If you ever need creative inspiration, just put her into like a podcast search engine and listen to any interview she's done. Oh, and she just has this like beautiful take on creativity where um, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how, like what your body looks like what how how you what your relationship status is what you, is in your bank account like all this stuff that gets in the way of our creativity through like capitalism or culture or whatever where we're told like oh you're not enough or it has to look this way for you to have this she was like you have to throw all that away and just get back to the basics of like that child impulse of like i want to play pretend i want to draw this comic book character I want to talk like this because it makes me happier you know like not judging yourself and um I don't like it's weird I just I didn't even consider any of that stuff like I didn't realize I was putting limitations on myself on my own creativity based on a way that I thought it was supposed to go through I don't know 
comparing myself to like Catherine Zeta Jones or something, you know what I mean? Like someone who's not me or the shame I felt when I was a hostess in a restaurant had no money and felt like I'm never going to be an actor. I'm not an actor, you know, like I, I make $10 an hour, you know, like where it's like, says who and why and you know but like I don't know big magic it's it's just great at dismantling all those shitty narratives you put on yourself as to like why you can't have the thing that you want all the things that hold you back from being creative yeah that is so I've never heard of that book at all it's an awesome book it's 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 like a real easy read and it's very straightforward and just like yeah Oh, I'm totally reading that. Yeah, because I'm not to be uh, self-deprecating, but that's where I'm at currently in my yeah. career. So that'd yeah. be amazing to just read and enjoy. Uh, yes. Wow, thank you for recommending that. Seriously. You're welcome. And we don't and get enough book recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> just even like, seriously, like go on a hike today or just to walk and, and listen to Elizabeth Gilbert. Like she's just got the most beautiful soul and and she's just inspiring like she'll yeah. inspire your own creativity and I think it's like important for actors to know that all the self-doubt and like the really hard times of your creative journey that's that's a part of it and there's always like this yin and yang process where you're in this space now but that means something really big is gonna come and balance it you know and I have to believe that to keep going <laughs> yeah. I hear you. I hear you 100%. I have to. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, I, I think where like we get in the way of ourselves is carrying shame that it should look a different way mm. when it's just like, this is just where it is right now. But there is no difference between you and I at all in how like, like, I don't believe that actors are better than each other because one is working and one isn't it's just somebody's got lucky you know somebody just got really lucky and and hit it and and you will and the thing is like we just can't control that like it could be when you're in your 50s you know what I mean and that's when you're gonna like work the most right but like your life is meaningful and valuable and you shouldn't negate that hoping that like I don't know, like waiting for like the acting to happen. Like, I think I had a lot of my own self-confidence wrapped up in like, well, when I'm a working actor, that's when I will be worthy of all the things that I want. Where it's like, no, you're here. You're here. Acting's a thing you do. It's not who you are. I think so anyway. I, you're giving us so many grains of truth here. (laughs) <laughs> that one of the last questions I'm going to ask is going to be like, ah, well, outside of everything else we just talked about, what about this? I know that's a hundred percent absolutely right. That acting is something you do, not who you are. Like, like that's until you realize that you're not going to be happy. You're going to be so focused on getting the job that eventually you're just going to get so burnt out thinking that way. That's, yeah. that's not good for anybody. It's completely wow. unhealthy. Um, I, so thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, um, I, I have to ask this cause I, I, I'm under the impression you might have something really good for this. Uh, no pressure by the way, but <laughs> I love asking our guests, uh, to share a party story. So a party story for us is something that occurred that was so impactful to your life that you could memorize a story left and right. And you could easily tell it at a party amongst friends. So it could be something that happened on a set while you were auditioning, while you weren't auditioning, just something that happened in your life that stands out so much, you'll never forget it. Do you have something like that you could share with us? Oh my gosh, that's related to acting? It it doesn't have to be related to acting. I mean, honestly, it could be any experience in your life that is so impactful. This, I wouldn't say it was like impactful, but it's something that shook me to my core and it was just bizarre. I was about 20, I think I was 23. It was before Absentia. I was living in an apartment with a ton of people, really broke. I had met a, like a guy at uh, this group dinner. It was a friend's birthday. 
and he was from Virginia. I'm from Virginia. He was a lawyer. I was an aspiring actress. Anyway, <laughs> he was like, listen, I can't even like, <laughs> it's so crazy that like, <laughs> I'm having trouble even just like telling it. Basically, he was like, I'd like to hire you to come with me to be like a date at this party so we can spy on this like client of mine. And like, I don't know, it was some kind of, I don't know, this is, this is a crash and burn. We're deleting this. <laughs> Why? We gotta keep this. This is perfect. <laughs> it was just, it was so, I mean, he base. I just feel like, I guess, naive or something, but he basically like paid me to be his like girlfriend at a party to like get information from this like couple that he was like investigating but he ended up just being like a real sad story and it was all a lie and he was too scared to like ask me to go on a date. Yeah, it was like a crazy, like a crazy, bizarre, like, uns I mean, he was fine. He was like a nerdy guy, but it just was like an introduction to all the broken people in Los Angeles. <laughs> I never saw him again. No? seriously no I, I never saw him again I think he was too embarrassed oh my god of all the things to make up to ask somebody out oh it was crazy yeah like that I will say right after that that guy reads comic books <laughs> probably <laughs> <laughs> that oh that's so weird okay that just sounds like a premise for a movie nobody's written yet it was, oh, sorry. I left out the most important thing. His ex fiance was at this party with like her new flame or whatever. So he basically just wanted to make her feel jealous. It was like that, that kind of thing. So, oh. but he made up this like extravagant story to get me to come with him. And I was like, dude, you could have just told me like, Hey, I'm brokenhearted. And my ex is at this party. Like, here <laughs> I don't know like, I would have done it you know I would have been like yeah but like, it was crazy I like I have no words for that right? that is such a crazy story it's one of the most bizarre things that's ever happened to me yeah that that's a very LA interaction yeah. slash date from what I've heard which is why I'm so glad I'm not dating in LA no <laughs> it's a scary place to date for sure can't do it well I, I, don't, I don't even know how to segue from that I know that's what I'm how, like I don't think you don't even need this in the podcast it's kind of a I I don't know that was so it's so off-putting enough to hear that that's definitely a party story because I can tell just by it like looking at as you as you were trying to tell it how do I put this into words you I, know I, yeah I still am I, like how did that happen there's I mean I left out a lot of other details that were crazy i just was Ooh. like i don't have enough time <laughs> <laughs> that'll that'll be for next time it'll be for the next, next time. time yeah yeah yeah. uh well it's gonna segue perfectly <laughs> into right. this question which is if you have any advice you could pass on to those who are getting in the arts industry now or maybe those who are just trying to stay inside of it do you have any sort of words of wisdom any sage advice you could pass on to them I think to just be in your own life and to know that you are a big pizza pie and being an actor is just the slice of all the many things that you are and relationships you have and your creative experience. It's not the industry's job to facilitate your creativity or your financial stability. You got to do it on your own. Acting is luck like working as an actor, is, it's just luck. It's luck meets talent, meets preparation, meets skill, it's all that. But um, look, you know, like I had no ties to the entertainment industry. I just came out blind and broke and it took me a decade to get things moving. And and I know Mike Flanagan, you know what I mean? Like, that was not, <laughs> like and it's still took 10 years. Like, um, <laughs> I, I think like when your heart is broken that's like can be actually a really beautiful opening place because it's not really about 
acting or not getting the job. It's usually about something else. And I think the most healing people can do on themselves, like the better your artistry is. Um, so I'm just like a big advocate. I'm sure you can tell for like mental health therapy, workout, put good stuff in your body. Don't drink a lot. Don't, you know, like control your anxiety because being an artist is, it can be a really fluid, beautiful experience. And it can also just be like the tight fist, you know, the anxiety is great. You get 15 pages of dialogue the night before you got to put it on, you know, tape. It's, it's anxiety ridden, but um, I don't know. Perfectionism is the opposite of creativity. So these are things I tell myself and have friends that are creative that you like collaborating with. I love that. Most of what you just said could be put on a mural and hung on a wall of a casting <laughs> office. Like it's it no, it means so much. Seriously, to to, to hear those, especially from your journey too, from working so hard for those ten years and still working your ass off to the point where you're confident in and of yourself to know that you are worth more than just non-union work that's uh you know paid 50 bucks a day when you have this experience and you know better you know than to allow yourself to do that like it's just it's really cool hearing that sensibility from somebody who has achieved success is still you know trying to get better and better each and every day that's just it, every piece of advice you gave is something that somebody could hang on to so thank you so much for that seriously well, thank you. I like, I think it's so important to have these stories out because I, I would always listen to like, um, you know, like I love Jessica Chastain. I think she's like an amazing actress. And then she would talk about how hard her journey was. But to me, I was like, you went to Juilliard and got a holding deal right out of the gate made some probably not a lot of money, but probably like 40 grand or something. I'm guessing I have no idea how much money she made. But like, it's a different journey that's hard for her. But I was like, wow, like mine is way grittier than that. And then somebody else's is going to be grittier than mine. You know, like I have friends who slept in their car for like the first couple of years of living in LA and were homeless and they're actors, you know, it's like, those are the stories that I think are really important for other artists to hear because we're so used to hearing like the Hollywood reporter stories of the people who, went to Juilliard or their parents is, are producers or directors or they're you know born into the industry or um or came up at a time where the business looked different you know and we had like a middle class and you could like have a few guest spots on friends and make a couple hundred grand you know it's like it's such a different industry now and it continues to change and evolve and I think the more we have everyone's story the more our own stories become possible. Boom. Nailed Boom. it. <laughs> well, I, I have two quick things. Uh, as we like wrap up this recording, God, the caffeine's kicking in. Jesus, slow <laughs> down. Uh, is there anything you'd like for us to promote in this episode? It could be Next Exit, of course, which we'll promote. Um, but any, like you said, you like to volunteer, any charities or volunteer programs you'd like for us to acknowledge uh, in the shout outs and promotions section? Oh man, I love the, oh, my puppy dogs, she's barking. Um, honestly, I just go down to my local library and I help out there. The Boys and Girls Club is great. Um, I volunteer at the AIDS Foundation here in Los Angeles. And that's what I've been doing recently. I also put actors on tape all the time and coach actors when I have time. Um, and I love doing it because it's the best way to learn. Yeah. Yeah, oh. it's the best way to learn to watch other that. actors be like, I can't. And I'm like, but you can. <laughs> <laughs> Make a fist. <laughs> release. Yeah. Well, as we wrap up this recording, um, there's one good thing or one good thing. One last thing I like to do, which is an awkward goodbye. Uh, have you ever seen Wayne's World? <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, like 20 years ago. Okay. Yeah, yeah. What? Oh, okay. Put that on the list you know, since yeah, you're not yeah, serving I anymore. I gotta do a, re a rewatch for sure, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm gonna give you a silent Wayne's World countdown, like three, two, one, and point. And when I point to you, give me your best verbal awkward goodbye and I'll stop the recording. You think you, you, you you'll be able to be as awkward as possible? Yeah, okay. 
So, okay, I can do that. Okay. You look so focused right now. <laughs> I know. I'm like, what am I going to do? <laughs> oh, we'll just, just see what happens. Okay. Let it go. Let it go. And...